Welcome everyone to the fall 2021 Martin Gardner Celebration of Mind series of talks. We are very honored to have Professor Steven Storgatz with us. Professor Storgatz is probably best known for his work in nonlinear dynamics and complex systems. Uh, he also has a number of very popular math books. And um, today, oh, also I should mention, he has one of the most highly cited papers of all time in physics. His work with Duncan Watts on small world networks has, I just checked this morning, 47,000 some odd citations. So we're very pleased to have Professor Surgatz here. And today he's gonna to be speaking with us about writing about math for the New York Times. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for the nice introduction. I suppose I should probably begin by talking just briefly about uh, Martin Gardner, who as a kid, you know, I used to, like probably so many of us, I would eagerly read his mathematical games columns in the New York, uh, sorry, in Scientific American, because at the time, and I'm thinking here like the 1970s, um, you really couldn't find math in the newspaper at all. And if you wanted to keep up with the latest, Martin Gardner was it. I mean, that was where you, you could go as a, as a math fan in those days. Um, Ian Stewart wasn't really writing much at that point, neither was Keith Devlin. I mean, these were, these were some of the great popularizers and expositors of math in that era about 50 years ago, but especially Martin Gardner. Um, so, you know, I sort of, as someone who wanted to try to explain math to my friends, but couldn't find too many listeners, I always dreamed of, of having Martin Gardner's job. I thought that would be fantastic if, if I would ever get a chance to explain math to the public or share this beautiful subject of ours with people more widely. Uh, and it turned out that I, I did get a chance to do that thanks to this next gentleman, um, David Shipley, who was the opinion page editor of the New York Times in the um, early 2000s. Around that time, I had just written my first book for the public. Uh, it was a book called Sync about how things in nature get in sync and, and uh, the math that goes along to explaining that and describing it. And so around that time, I started trying to write op-ed pages, op-ed pieces for the, the paper. And so David Shipley accepted some of them and published them in the New York Times. And at one point he asked me if I would ever have time to write a series of, of math articles for his readers, which I was kind of stunned by because I had never seen anything like that in the New York Times, a series of articles about math. So trying to make sense of what he was saying, I, I said to him, well, uh, I know op-eds are supposed to be about something topical, like you want me to write about the math of climate change or maybe the math of, um, at that time, the, the financial crisis of 2008 had just occurred. So maybe something about math there. He said, no, you totally misunderstand what I have in mind. Um, I would like you to try to write about numbers. And then after you do a column about numbers, then write about addition. And then after you do addition, then do subtraction. And like that, I mean, he really literally was proposing that I walk through the elementary school curriculum um, through high school and into college and as far as I could get. You know, just try to, except he said, make it interesting. <laughs> you know, so he described himself as someone who had been an English major in college. He said he, he could do math in high school. He didn't have any real trouble in his math courses, but he never saw the point of it. Didn't think it was very interesting. Um, and he felt that a lot of the readers of the New York Times might be similar to him, either people who, who could do math but didn't care. Um, and also some people who felt left out that when we go on about how elegant it is or how beautiful, he'd heard mathematicians or math fans using words like that, but he never understood what they meant. And he thought that if I could convey some of that to the readers of the times, that would be worth trying. Um, so I mention all this because I think that the audience that David Shipley was describing and the audience that I was trying to write for is not Martin Gardner's audience. I think those of us that used to read Martin Gardner for pleasure didn't need that kind of invitation to math. We were reading him because we were already interested in math. We liked it. We might have known it was beautiful or useful. And, and what Martin Gardner did so well was, was take us to the frontiers of what was going on in math with great clarity and precision and 
plain spoken language, just, just wonderful. But I didn't think that was exactly what was called for for David Shipley's request. It seemed to me that there was a whole psychological, maybe even psychiatric dimension to what he was describing because a lot of the readers that I was going after have what people call math phobia or math anxiety. Like these are people who would never read a Martin Gardner column or a, or a book about math. So in this talk, what I wanna do is try to tell you what little adventures I had in writing for that audience and um, what things seemed to work and what things didn't work so well. Uh, the series was 15 columns. It came out once a week in the year 2010. We started in January and they were calling it the elements of math. And as you can maybe see, although the print may be too small, I started with a, a column about numbers using Sesame Street characters. By the way, this was um, online. So it was not in the, the print New York Times. It was the online version, which meant that I could show videos. I could um, use audio files, could show color. I mean, it was just, it gave a lot more options. To, and of course you could reach a very wide audience online. I did what I was told. I, I started with numbers. I then did a column about addition one about subtraction, getting into the mysteries of negative numbers, and so on, marching through the curriculum, eventually ending after 15 weeks with the Hilbert Hotel and Infinity. The crazy thing was that it turns out there's an audience for this sort of thing. Like here was the first column that came out in January, um, on January 31st, 2010. I was just trying to explain why numbers are useful, how numbers are more abstract, like six fish is a less abstract concept than the concept of six itself. And that six applies to six spark plugs, six cinnamon buns, you know, that there's already an abstraction just in the concept of numbers. So anyway, that, that column then got a bit philosophical, started talking about the unreasonable effectiveness of math in the natural sciences that Eugene Wigner had written about. Anyway, the, the readers ate it up. It was kind of incredible. Here, they got 550 comments. The first, uh, the kind, these were typical. This person says, I can't even explain how incredibly excited I am about this. Thank you. Or this person says, I, I'm, how exciting. I'm so glad to see something like this in the New York Times and eagerly await your columns. So the way I tried to describe it to these readers was that um, first I described this friend of mine who's an artist who likes science but is, feels left out by math. He says that the strange symbols keep him out. He doesn't even know how to pronounce them. His alienation runs a lot deeper. Like, what are we doing in math uh, all day long? So I had him in mind. Actually, I'll just tell you who this was. This is the actor, Alan Alda, who some of you will know uh, is very interested in communicating science to the public. And he, and he had a show for some years called um, Scientific American Frontiers, uh, where he would interview scientists from all kinds of different disciplines and talk about their work in anthropology or oceanography or physics or whatever, but never math. And so it happens, I got to meet him um, and became very friendly with him. And he always wants me to tell him about math, which he says he just doesn't understand at all. So I, I had him in mind as the sort of educated but unknowledgeable reader. As I say here in the column, I was gonna write about the elements of math for anyone out there who would like to have a second chance at the subject but from an adult perspective, so not remedial. Anyway, so here we go. Let me show you some examples of the kinds of things I tried to do. What, one principle that seemed to work pretty well was um, keep it light. So try to have a laugh with the readers. And as an example, here was a column or an excerpt from a column that had to do with percentages. Um, and also units, the importance of keeping track of units in the real world. So, you know, a lot of folks, believe it or not, are puzzled by a number like 0 0.002. Just the way that's written bothers more people than you might imagine. So in this example, you're going to hear a call from a customer who was quoted a rate uh, for data usage, 0 0.002 cents per kilobyte, but he found that when he was um, received his bill, he was being charged at a rate 100 fold what he was quoted 0 0.002 dollars per kilobyte. And so check out his uh, frustrating conversation with Verizon customer service. You can, by the way, you can hear this if you wanna listen to it in longer 
um, detail. And there's a transcript available too on the on YouTube under the name Verizon Math Fail. Looks like you're questioning some kilobyte usage that was done while in Canada. Point zero zero two dollars. Do you recognize that there's a, there's actually point zero zero two cents? Yes. Do you recognize there's a difference between those two numbers? No. Point zero zero two dollars and point zero zero two cents. Yes. Is there a difference so they're, between? They're, they're both the same if you if you look at them on paper wise. No, they're not actually. It, so if you take point zero zero two cents, remember cents time thirty five thousand eight hundred ninety six seventy one dollars seventy nine. No, that would be seventy one cents. How much should I be charged? By by the way this is calculated, seventy one dollars and seventy nine cents. You're paying two tenths of a penny per kilobyte. Two you tenths of hold on, hold on. two tenths of a penny would be point two cents. You quoted me point zero zero two cents. So which is the real rate? Point zero zero two, sir. Point zero zero two what? Cents per kilobyte. So you just said it was point two pennies. And then you also said it's point zero zero two cents. Those are two completely different numbers. They're one hundred fold different. Okay, George, hold on one second for sure. me, okay? This is Andrew. I'm a manager on the floor. How can I help you today? Hi. Do you recognize that there's a difference between one dollar and one cent? Definitely. Do you recognize that there's a difference between half a dollar and half a cent? Definitely. Then do you therefore recognize that there's a difference between point zero zero two dollars and point zero zero two cents? No. I'm teaching math here. And we're talking about cents, right? Right, point zero zero two. If we multiply that by the amount of kilobyte usage that you have, three five eight nine three. Three five eight nine three. That comes out to what you paid seventy one seventy nine cents. You never did the conversion from cents to dollars. I don't know. I'm not a mathematician. Point zero zero two cents. Right. Times my thirty five thousand eight hundred ninety three. It's, is a number, but it's still in cents. We're not quoting point zero zero two dollars. We're quoting point zero zero two cents. Oh God, honestly. Well, I mean, it's obviously a difference of opinion. It's not opinion. It's not okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to post this recording on my blog. <laughs> All right. Um, you get the idea. I won't. I won't go on with that. But you know, it's it's very exasperating. But it's also a point of confusion for many folks. And so this was the kind of thing I was trying to unpack a little bit in this column on what you might think was such an elementary topic, you can't even write about it. There are a lot of interesting subtleties about percentages, fractions, decimals, all kinds of ideas. Now, the risk, by the way, with this first principle of share a laugh with the audience is that some people will not get the joke and will feel that you're laughing at them. So the second principle is empathy. Try to empathize with the readers, or you know, if you're giving a talk to a general audience, I think it's helpful if you can share your own confusion um, and then help the, the reader get past it. So in my case, I tried to empathize by remembering a time in my own life when I was confused about what should have been an elementary thing. And um, you know, so I'm not condescending to the reader. So here's an example along those lines. It was an old problem that my uncle Irving had uh, asked me when I was about 10 years old. You'll recognize this type of problem. It's um, one of those strange questions where faucets are running at different rates. It's, it's a bathtub, it's being filled um, by a faucet. If you were to fill it with the cold water only, we're told it would only take a half hour that's gushing out, it's coming out fast. Whereas the hot water faucet, the water runs more slowly. It would take a full hour if you tried to fill it with hot water alone. And the question is, if you were running both faucets at the same time, how long would it take to fill the tub? As I say, my uncle Irv asked me this question. I was about 10 years old. You might think to yourself, what would a 10 year old guess in a situation like this? Um, 
Maybe I should invite a little audience participation. Type into the chat. You could, if you want to show off, you could type in the correct answer. But, but really what I want you to do is type in, what do you think my 10-year-old self said as an answer to this question? What's a plausible thing that a kid might say? Let's look at the chat. 45 minutes. Tyler says 1.5 hours, right? Those are the two very reasonable guesses for a child, right? You might think as a kid, maybe I should add the numbers, you'd come up with 1.5 hours. You might think, as I did, I saw for whatever reason, I should take the average, 45 minutes. And of course, my uncle started laughing at me for the reason that Red is explaining in the chat that of course it has to be less than half an hour um, because just running on its own, the cold water would fill up the tub in half an hour. So with the hot water helping, it has to be less than half an hour. Okay, so anyway, my uncle was laughing at me and it really stung and it, it made a kind of lifelong impression on me that it didn't feel good to get laughed at about a math problem. Um, so I really did feel foolish. Anyway, my uncle then went on to explain, okay, look, Stephen, here's how you should think about it. Think of how much does each one fill up in one minute? So uh, the one that takes 60 minutes to fill the tub would fill 1 60th of the tub in one minute. The other one fills up 1 30th of the tub in one minute. And so then running together, they fill 1 60th plus 1 30th. And if you then know how to do common denominators, which I'm not even sure if I knew that at the time, um, you can then conclude it's 2 60th plus 1 60th, that's 3 60th, which is 1 20th. So 20 minutes to fill the whole tub. Okay, so that was Uncle Irving's solution, and I recognized that it was right, uh, but I didn't like it, first for the humiliation I felt, but also because I thought it was kind of an ugly solution. I mean, even at that age, I felt like this is sort of, there's something, it's true, but, but it's not pleasant. There's something I didn't like about it, and so I think even at that stage in my life, I was having what we in math think of as the difference between an elegant solution and an ugly solution. Um, they can both be right, but one is better than another. So I wanted to get that idea across to the readers of the Times, and I thought this was a good example for that because it's so elementary and it allows for this kind of imaginative solution. There's a much easier way to see why it will take 20 minutes, which I drew with this kind of fantastic uh, picture. Imagine that there were a conveyor belt that instead of just thinking of one bathtub, imagine the bathtubs can move past the faucets. Then one of the faucets fills one bathtub per hour and the other one fills two bathtubs per hour because it takes 30 minutes to fill one bathtub. So in total, you get three bathtubs per hour, which is one bathtub every 20 minutes. And so I think that's a much quicker way than thinking about common denominators. Um, and you know, requires a little bit of creativity to see it that way. You, I'm sure you can think of other good ways to get 20 minutes. But anyway, the point was that this was um, a chance to empathize with the confusion that some of the, the readers might be having. Now, another trick, kind of an obvious thing in a way, but for a lot of people, math was always just about rote calculation and they never had what we like so much, this aha moment a kind of epiphany or a feeling like I suddenly get it, you know, a flash of inspiration or illumination that makes you really, it gives us a lot of pleasure. So to try to convey the, the feeling of aha um, in a very elementary setting, I thought, why don't we go back to the area of a circle, which I know that the readers of the times will have memorized the formula pi r squared for the area of a circle where r is the radius, but I'm sure many of them don't really know why pi r squared is the correct formula. And so I tried to walk them through with this argument, which I find a very aha inducing argument if you've never seen it before. I'm sure most of you have seen it, but in any case, let me just show you what I showed the, the readers. First, I reminded them what pi is, the ratio of circumference to the diameter, giving them that definition. Uh, then, saying, let's suppose we take a circle and chop it into four pieces and rearrange them in this funny way. Um, the argument being, if we could figure out the area of this weird shape, since we're just rearranging the pieces, it would have the same area as the circle. Now, it looks like we made the problem worse because this shape, it's not clear what the area of that is either. Um, but we do know a couple things about this shape, which is that half the circumference is on the bottom 
and half the circumference is, since I told them the circumference is pi times the diameter, half of that would be pi times half the diameter, so pi times the radius. So half the circumference is down here and half the circumference is up there. Also, this piece, this straight line is the radius, that's the distance from what used to be the center to the, the circle. Okay, so you see that picture, it's not clear what to do. And I think it's almost like drama that we've made our, our character get into trouble. You know, like in a good story, the character gets in trouble and then it has to get resolved. You have to get out of trouble. So here you get out of trouble by making more slices. If you make eight slices, now you have this picture. And again, half the circumference is on the bottom. So this curvy part is pi r in length. This part is again r, but notice that it's standing up straighter. Right? Instead of that much tilt, it's now more vertical. And also this part looks flatter than it used to. The curves are less bulbous, right? These, this was rounder than this. It seems to be flattening out and getting more upright. If you take 16 pieces, and these are the pictures that appeared in the Times, these color images, you can see it looks like it's trying to converge to something that is flat on the bottom with an upright R. And in the limit, of taking infinitely many infinitesimally thin slices, you would get this rectangle with dimensions pi r and r. And so now it's obvious the area should be pi r squared, the product of those two. So I gave this argument. Of course, you know, you can quibble about certain points of rigor that I've glossed over. That wasn't important for the purposes of the newspaper. I, I did have footnotes where I could say, you know, there are some delicate aspects of it and point readers to places where they could learn more if they were interested. But that would be the case, that would be like an instance of letting the details get in the way of the punchline. The punchline being that there's this magnificent rearrangement argument that uses infinity in this strategic way to make a hard problem simple. Um, and remarkably, this article made it to the number one most emailed article in the New York Times for several days in a row. People love this argument. Um, which shows that among the broader public, there is a real hunger for beautiful math. I mean, these people will like it if you show it to them in a way that gives them an aha moment. And so in every column, no matter how elementary, I tried to always have some moment of genuine math, some kind of proof or some beautiful argument or something, not just talking about math, but actually doing some math. And I, I think it is possible to do, and, and there is a hunger for it and an appreciation. So um, you don't have to dumb it down, that's what I'm trying to say. All right, so continuing with, with things that seem to work, um, another technique that probably everybody would first think of is that readers can relate to, if you can show them that math is relevant in the real world, for those people who like applications or connections, this will um, be very motivating. So for instance, to explain ideas of calculus and the fact that at the top of Michael Jordan's parabolic arc as he jumps and appears to hang in midair. Um, when he's at the very top, his vertical velocity is zero. He's not going up or down at that moment of hanging. And so that then got us into ideas of derivatives and um, the fact that at the Mac, you can look for a maximum by looking for a place where a smooth curve has a derivative of zero. So I tried to introduce ideas of derivatives and and maxima and minima with this visual example and the sensation that he appears to be hanging in the air, even though of course he's not really, but um, instantaneously he is. So as an example though, with some real uh, substance to it for math connecting to the real world, I gave what is a pretty standard example of conditional probability, a very tricky, notoriously tricky concept um, using Bayes rule to apply to this life and death matter of mammogram screening, breast cancer screening for women. Now you'll recognize of course that Bayes rule is not the kind of thing you're usually seeing in the New York Times. Nevertheless, I felt this was such a compelling example and it has a whole psychological story that goes with it. Uh, I wanted to try it, see if, it, if I could get away with it. So here's the way I tried it. I gave an example that comes from this book by Gerd Gigerenster, who is a social psychologist um, who works on human cognitive errors and cognitive biases. Um, this was a book, Calculated Risks, all about our misunderstanding of probability and 
chance and risk. He um, has done a lot of experiments along the line, similar to Kahneman and Sversky about human cognitive errors when it comes to probability. So in this study, he was um, testing doctors actually, including cancer doctors, oncologists, who are giving advice to women who come in for mammograms. So he quoted these numbers. Now, these are his numbers. I'm not going to vouch for whether they're accurate as far as the reliability of mammograms, but let's just accept these numbers. So this is what he read to a doctor. And then he asked the doctor to calculate the probability that a woman has breast cancer. So here's the scenario. The profit, okay, first, let me just back up. He said, imagine a woman in a low risk group. She has no family history of breast cancer. She's young, that is under 40. Um, there's really no reason to think that she would be at risk. But anyway, so the probability that a woman in this cohort, this low risk group would have breast cancer, 0.8%. If a woman does have breast cancer, the probability is 90% that she will test positive on the mammogram. If the woman does not have breast cancer, the probability is 7% that she will still have a positive mammogram, that she'll have a false positive. So the doctors were given all this information. Now, imagine that the woman tests positive. What is the probability that she actually has breast cancer? That's the question to the doctor. So he asked a number of doctors in Germany this question and uh, 24 German physicians, this is what they said. Given those numbers, their estimates range from 1% chance of having breast cancer to 90% chance. Pretty mortifying, you have to agree, right? I mean, imagine being in that, I mean, it's a really scary situation and your doctor has no idea what your odds are. Eight of the doctors that were asked thought the chances were 10% or less. Eight of them thought 90%. The remaining eight guessed somewhere between 50 and 80%. Now, if you think it's some failing of, medical training in Germany, that is not the case. Um, American doctors were given a multiple choice test with a few options and 95 out of 100 of them said the odds were 75% chance that the woman has breast cancer. The reason this is such an interesting question, I think, and suitable for the times is that there's a whole psychological aspect to this. This is a study being done by a psychologist. It's not just a math problem. It's how do people including very educated people, doctors, how do they think about these very confusing problems? And here's the interesting insight that Gigerenzer came up with. Okay, first of all, the answer is 9%, in case you're wondering. But you can see that very intuitively if you look at the numbers the right way. You use the same information that was given, except don't quote it as percentages. People do not understand percentages. You use what Gigerenzer calls natural frequencies, or what I would just call numbers. You just ask people to think like this. Imagine a thousand women and then translate those percentages into numbers. So we were told the odds were 0.8% of uh, that a woman would have in this cohort would have breast cancer. So that means eight out of a thousand. So out of this thousand that we're imagining, eight actually do have it. Of these eight, seven will test positive. Why? Because because remember that it said 90% chance that if you have it, the test will catch it. So we should be multiplying eight by 0.9. So really the number should be 7.2, but just to round it off, let's say seven of the eight actually will test positive. Of the remaining 992 women who don't actually have breast cancer, 70 will still test positive. Why? Because we were told that the test would say 7% of the time that a woman who doesn't have breast cancer does. So 7% of 992 is about 70. So now you have seven that test positive because they do have breast cancer and 70 that test positive, even though they don't. So now if you imagine a sample who tests positive, that's 77 total women of which only seven have breast cancer. So it's seven out of 77, which is one out of 11 or 9%. Um, that's, in other words, when you do it this way with numbers, you automatically do Bayes' rule by just having common sense. You don't have to be taught Bayes' rule. The calculation does itself as soon as you translate it into numbers. So incidentally, I did not write down Bayes' rule in the New York Times. That I don't think would work. Um, I've taught Bayes' rule many times to college students and they get really mixed up. 
But if they do it this way, which a lot of them do, they get it right every time. Um, it's interesting. This, this is the way that the human mind seems to understand it very well. So anyway, that column turned out to be very successful also in terms of being emailed around and, and readers really liking it, um, which might seem surprising given that it's a pretty sophisticated calculation. All right, so the last thing that seemed to work that uh, um, probably also won't surprise you is to be visual. Rather than using a lot of symbols in the newspaper, try to use pictures or um, something very palpable that can make an abstraction more tangible. So I, I wanted to do a, a piece about differential geometry and the idea of shortest paths on curved surfaces on, about geodesics. And so I figured everybody is familiar, at least the New York Times readers have probably you know, traveled a bit. And so I thought this example was interesting that when I was young, my father used to like to um, give me geography puzzles. And he asked me, which is farther south? Rome or New York City? And it seems like a trick question because the weather is you know, very nice and sunny in Rome. And you might assume that Rome is a little bit farther south or maybe even much farther south than New York. But if you look on the globe, you'll see that Rome and New York are, I don't remember which is farther south. I think possibly New York is farther south. They're, they're essentially on the same line of latitude. But what's interesting is if you've ever flown between those two cities, the flight path looks like this. You start in New York, you go way up here into the North Atlantic and then come down just below Ireland, across Europe, and then into Rome. You do not go due east. Right? You don't go on a line of latitude. I remember as a kid, you know, seeing this, thinking we're, we're like hugging the shoreline of Newfoundland and Canada in case one of our engines blows up you know, maybe we could still come back to land. That's not why we go over Canada. It's just the shortest path on the globe. You can see it if you hold the globe up, you'll see for yourself. But anyway, so I thought this would be nice and visual for people that straight lines on curved surfaces or the analog of straight lines can have surprising properties. And um, at this point, I think I made a mistake, which was I had seen a video that I thought was really interesting and I believed that visualization would carry the day uh, no matter how complicated the thing I was trying to explain. And so I wanted to explain what the shortest paths on a two-hold torus would look like based on this great video that I had seen. And I wanna show you this video and then tell you what the reaction was to this. So this is a, an animation by Conrad Poltier um, where he draws a motorcycle he makes an animation of a guy riding a motorcycle on a two-hold torus. Now, the motorcycle is peculiar in that um, the rider cannot steer the steering wheel. The steering wheel is locked in the straight ahead position. So it's not, the rider is never gonna be turning. He's just gonna ride on the surface of the two-hold torus, always going straight locally. Where straight, the intuitive idea of straight is that the the motorcycle is not turning its handles, it, handlebars. It's just going straight ahead. All right, so watch this. Watch what the, how crazy the geodesics are on a two-hold torus, and um, tell me what you think about this afterward. <laughs> So I don't know what you think of that. I mean, I, when I saw that, I thought it was absolutely wonderful that the geodesics on a surface like this could be so complicated that a straight line could cross itself, you know, globally as it winds around and around. So I, I felt sure that this would get the idea across. 
Now, when my wife, uh, Carol, saw this, she said, first of all, she didn't like the music, that it reminded her of some kind of, you know, crummy porno movie. Um, she thought this was a really stupid video. Didn't, I mean, she's not mathematical at all. She said, readers are going to hate that. And uh, I don't recommend it. And I don't think this is a good idea. I think you're going to lose people. Uh, I don't understand what that shape is. I don't see why it's interesting. She thought it was a real dud. And I said, no, no, believe me, this is a great video. And it's going to explain everything. And I'm going to be writing all these words. And I'll help the readers understand. It's going to be a big hit. Well, um, you can guess what the next lesson is. You know, you should listen to your wife. <laughs> or your partner or your mother or your friend or your child. That This was a case where, where I was really wrong. It, this was not a particularly successful column. People were pretty confused by it. And I think in retrospect, the mistake that I'm making here um, was, let me put it this way. I think there are two things that cause difficulty. To, let, like let's speak about the space of difficulty as being two dimensional. It's more than that, but just as a first approximation, things can be either like abstract or concrete. That's one dimension. Going from concrete to then more and more ethereal all the way to abstract, where I think you would agree that abstract tends to be more difficult than concrete. So that's one kind of axis of difficulty from concrete to abstract. Another axis is about familiarity. Things that are familiar tend to be easier or more readily accepted than things that are unfamiliar. So for instance, with the examples I've given earlier, the circle, the area of a circle, I would call that, deriving the, the formula for the area of a circle, I would call that an abstract problem, but one that's familiar, right? It's a formula, pi r squared, we're not talking about real world. I mean, we could talk about pizza, but as some people have suggested in the chat, but I was just phrasing it in the abstract realm of perfect circles. Nevertheless, it's so familiar. Everyone learned about it in middle school or high school. So I felt like I could get away with it because although it was abstract, it was familiar. Conversely, the Bayes rule example with breast cancer screening, although I thought it would be unfamiliar to most of the readers, I took some solace in that I felt it was very concrete. I mean, it's about a very important real world issue. So although it's unfamiliar, it's concrete. I think what I did wrong with the two hold torus was I was trying to do the two difficult things at the same time. I was doing something that was both abstract and unfamiliar. And I think that might be asking too much. So I just, I don't know, it's a speculation, but I offer that as my parting advice that if you're trying to write for the public or speak to the public, and, and specifically, not the Martin Gardner public, but the public I was going for, this, you know, math phobic or uh, the ones who need to be convinced that math is interesting. I think it's going to be too much to expect them to, to wade through something that's both unfamiliar and abstract. Or if you do it, you better really have your A game. Uh, it's going to take really great expository skill. Thank you, Stephen. That was, that was wonderful and slightly uh, disturbing, especially the Verizon call. All right, we can take questions in the chat or, or the Q&A. So Adam uh, asked what happened, what ended up happening to the Verizon call. Um, it's a long story. I don't think the guy ever got, you know, satisfaction monetarily. You can look him up on the internet. I'll type in the chat. I think his name is George Vaccaro. Spelled like that. And if you search for George Vaccaro and Verizon, he kept a a very long file of his interactions with Verizon. And you can see, you know, that I was just sort of skimming off the high point, but no, it's sort of what you might expect. They make an error in their favor and then they are very reluctant to agree. Another question I didn't understand in regard to the two hold Taurus, why did it start with a sphere dropping from the sky and splatting or whatever was happening? Yeah, there, there are some artistic choices made in that video that are questionable. I mean, why did the little motorcyclist come as a drop of water? I don't know. Yeah, weird. A medical comment from Thomas. Generally, doctors are recommended not to perform testing on low-risk populations, at least partly for this reason. Well, that's an interesting comment, Thomas, that because the tests are not super, I for, always forget this word, sensitive versus whatever the other word is. That's a bad, an example of, I think, bad communication. I think it's much better to speak in terms of false positives and false negatives. Um, 
but yeah, so in a case like this, where there are too many false positives, probably better not to do the testing, you say, Thomas? Interesting. With respect to the circle area visualization, there's a similar method for computing the volume of a sphere, says Colin. Um, interesting. You, you, can we let people unmute themselves to say more? The basic idea of the visualization for uh, getting the volume of a sphere is if you cover the surface of the sphere with a, a mosaic, think of a mirror ball in a disco or something, uh, and then take the cone from each area on the surface of the sphere to the center of the sphere, then the volume of that is one third times the radius times the area of the little pack. Nice. And then when you, when you add them all up, the answer is one third times the radius of the sphere times the surface area of the sphere. Beautiful. And then you get the surface area of the sphere from the Archimedes hat box theorem. Yes, yes, the one, right, the one relating it to the cylinder. Yeah, that, so yes, put, put, a, put, a yes sphere in, put a sphere inside a cylinder, uh, take two slices through it, and the thin slice of cylinder has the same surface area as the slopey cylinder that you've cut out of the surface of the sphere. Mm -hmm. So Thank it's, you. It's, a, it's a very similar, very similar visualization, and it has a limit hidden in it the same way as, as your... Uh, Air, circle area one does. Great, thank you. I see Jessica Sklar has made a comment, not true about mammograms. I guess, Jessica, you're referring to the, um, the issue about the false positives, but you say it is true about breast MRIs in practice. So that may be a good distinction for us, mammograms versus the MRIs. Um, let's see, so here's a question. What is a good way to introduce an abstract and unfamiliar topic? For instance, something that's math heavy with a lot of notation. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't have a good heuristic or a good suggestion for that. I think only to be sensitive that watch out that, you know, you're going to need extra care. So you might want to try warning the reader that there may be some heavy going in this and here's what, but the payoff will be worth it. I don't know, something to, to keep people on board with whatever difficult efforts you're going to have to make to succeed. I, I, uh, would generally, avoid it unless necessary, <laughs> you know? I mean, of course, at some points you do have to do it. Um, and so, yeah, I think just showing the reader that you're really with them and you understand that it might be hard. I think readers will tolerate a lot if they think it's worth it. But I mean, you know, like that's sort of the issue with the two hole Taurus. Why were we even doing this? I, I'm not, I don't think I made it sufficiently motivated in that case. One qu good question here on yeah. how far you got in your math. Did you attempt to explain groups or other math concepts? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a column about group theory that I was very happy with. It was called groupthink. So if you search for groupthink and, and my last name, it will pop up. I, I used an idea that Brian Hayes used in his book called Group Theory in the Bedroom, <laughs> which, okay, he's having some fun too. But um, he describe group theory by thinking about mattress flipping. So, you know, in the old days, people would flip their mattress every so often to try to get more wear out of it. And so I had a, an artist do little cartoons for me like this one, where this gentleman in the striped pajamas is flipping this mattress over as the, the manufacturers used to recommend you would do um, in the spring and in the fall. So, and there's of course various ways of flipping the mattress. Um, nowadays, a lot of mattresses only have a top surface and the bottom is not equivalent to the top. But I was imagining here that the bottom was equivalent to the top, like on an old mattress. And I was trying to make the point that group theory is related to things like the symmetries of the patterns you might see. Um, this is a chaotic looking mosaic reminiscent of the Alhambra. And so anyway, but, but in, here I started labeling the mattress. I talked about this kind of move where you flip the mattress over this way. I called that thing a horizontal flip. Then you could also flip it this way where you sort of stand the mattress up and go, um, you know, like you make it practically touch the ceiling and then it got to flip over that way and makes a big thud when it hits. Or you could just rotate it while keeping it flat on the bed. The idea being that it always has to lie on the frame of the, the bed. 
So those are the only allowed moves. So you have these three moves plus the move where you don't do anything, the identity. And so from this, I just started trying to walk the reader through all the different properties of these various, um, you know, the relations between all these different operations is kind of like a, a mattress version of a Cayley diagram. And actually, I was getting the idea for that from this nice book by Nathan Carter. So one of the fun things about writing this um, series was I could give shout outs to books like Brian Hayes's collection of essay or Nathan Carter's wonderful introduction to group theory, visual group theory. So by doing that, you know, I could walk the reader through the group that you will recognize as the Klein four group without having to say Klein four group. I mean, I could walk them through the, the various properties of multiplication. And then, I, you know, to try to make it not just a math thing, but also show that this has connections to something you might care about beyond mattresses. I, I told this little story about Richard Feynman. You may know this story, but if not, this is me trying to be funny again, um, that Feynman goes to, in, you know, for his exam in the army and he doesn't want to go to the army. So the doctor asks him to put his hands out and he puts one hand like this and the other hand like that. Right. And the doctor says, no, the other way. And then he goes like that. <laughs> so one hand up, the other down. Anyway, but it's a little bit of group theoretic humor. And if you look at all these operations of the way he could have held his hands out and then the various flips, it's the same group. So it's isomorphic I mean, to the Klein four group. And I don't know, I thought it was fun to get across the idea that the same groups pop up in different circumstances. So we were able to do group theory as well as, like I say, differential geometry, a little bit of set theory. Um, later, the, these columns got put together along with 15 new ones in the book, Joy of X, where I also tried to do some things that were college or grad school level topology and stuff like that. Dr. Sorgatz is the host of a podcast called The Joy of X. So um, you should all check that out. Thank you very much, Steve. That was uh, it was excellent talk and um, informative, a little bit disturbing, as, <laughs> as I said. Um, Thank you, Bob. And um, we're, again, we're very honored that you uh, decided to, to join us here. Thank you all. Bye-bye.